Welcome to Shankar's daily editorial analysis. Today's topic of discussion is three editorials. We have taken two editorials from the Indian Express newspaper and the third editorial from the The Hindu newspaper. And in the first editorial, we will discuss about what is food subsidies, what are the impact of food subsidies. And in the second editorial, we will discuss what is seventh schedule, what are federalism, what are the measures to ensure the federalism, what is the impact of introduction of GST and what are the strategies which can be used by the state to generate alternate revenue. And in the third editorial, we will discuss what is Right to Education Act. We will also see what is Madrasas and we will also discuss about the constitutional as well as legal provisions to ensure the social justice as well as the child rights. Without further delay, let us get into today's discussion. Take a look at this editorial, an investment and not a waste. This editorial is mainly focusing on the benefits of the food subsidy given by the government of India because these food subsidies are ensuring the food security of the people, especially the vulnerable section of the society. The writer of this editorial is arguing that even though the input subsidies are creating some harm in the society, the food subsidy is having no negative impacts because he highlighted the fact that this food subsidy was highly beneficial especially in the COVID condition because it ensured the food security of most people of the India during that condition. So, we have to learn about the food subsidy and what are the impacts it have on the India from the mains perspective detaily. Let us start with the mains question first. So, take a look at this question. Subsidies in India ensure food security for the vulnerable population, but balancing them with the agricultural innovation and sustainability is a challenge. So, this is the statement they are referring here and they are continuing with critically analyze this in the context of India's food security and the agricultural policy. So, you can write the answer for this question and post in the comment section. We will review it for you. So, let us start with a basic understanding that what is food subsidies. So, these are financial assistance which are provided by the government to the government to the consumers in India. So, thereby the food will be affordable at a subsidized rate to the vulnerable sections of the society. So, this will reduce the cost of food efficiently and the main aim of providing the, the food subsidy is to ensure the food security in India which is the 3A accessible, affordable and availability of the food grains. So, by providing the food subsidy, we can ensure the food security and it will also ensure there is a price stability that is the food will be available at a subsidized rate even at the worst conditions such as the market fluctuation in the country. These are the two main aim and objective of providing the food subsidy to the people. So, in India, the Food Corporation of India will procure the food grains at the MSP rate and they will store them in the warehouses. So, and then the P through the help of the PDS system, it is distributed to the people, low income families. So, what is the condition of food subsidy in India? It is mainly done through a system called as the public distribution system, where the government of India will procure the food from the farmers at the MSP and they will distribute the food with the help of the public distribution system where the food will be, the food grains will be provided at a subsidized rate so that it will be affordable to the lower sections of the society. So, in India, we also have an act to ensure the food security in India that is called as the National Food Security Act of 2013. So, with the help of this public distribution system, the foods are provided at a subsidized rate to almost two-third of the India's population which is a significant amount. Thereby, the food subsidy is helping us to ensure the food security in the nations. Now, we will see what are the key components of the food subsidy. First is the PDS which was launched in the year 1965. With the help of this system, the government will distribute the food grains, especially the rice and wheat to the 
लो इनकम कंट्रीज बट वन आर्ग्यूमेंट आर क्रिटिसाइज रिगार्डिंग दि पब्लिक डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन सिस्टम इज दैट दे आर ओनली प्रोवाइडिंग दि सब्सिडाइज क्रेन एस्पेली फोकसिंग ऑन रईज एंड वीट इफ यू आर गोयिंग टू डवर्सिफाई दि प्रोडक्ट्स विच आर गिवन इन द पीरियड बै इनक्लूडिंग दि पलस आयिल अंड मिल वि कैन फर्दर इंप्रूव दि न्यूट्रिशनल रिक्वयर्मेंट आफ दि पीपल and next we have the food corporation of india they will procure the food from the farmers and they will store and distribute the food grains throughout the country with the help of this system called as the pds system and as already said we have a act called as the national food security act of 2013 which aims to ensure the food security of the people because they are going to provide the food grains as a subsidized rate and another thing is that they are providing the grains to almost two third of the population that is almost 75 percentage of the rural population and 50 percentage of the urban household here you can understand what is the significant amount of beneficiaries they are covering in case of india so what are the benefits of this providing food subsidies it is going to alleviate the hunger because the food is affordable and accessible to the people of india especially to the vulnerable people so that they will have a additional income or some extra amount which they can spend in other essential activities or services which they need for carrying out their daily life it will also ensure the food security because it is available at a marginalized and a subsidized rate which will be almost affordable for the vulnerable sections also it is providing a safety net to the low income people so they are able to meet the nutritional requirement and the calorie requirement because they are having access to the food at the affordable rate as these foods are available at a subsidized rate it is helping them to defend the inflation and price volatility in the country even though there is market fluctuation the government will provide them at a subsidized rate so they are having a say in the purchase of the products so now we have to understand what is the difference between the agricultural subsidy and the food subsidy both these subsidies are having a same objective that is they are focused on the agriculture sector and to ensure a food security to the people of india but their method of doing that is different because the agricultural subsidies are primarily focused on the producer who are farmers but the food security or the food subsidy is is focused on the consumers so in agricultural subsidies the subsidies are given to the farmers to purchase the inputs for their production for example in case of fertilizer electricity water seeds and the machinery the main aim or the goal of these subsidy is to lower the cost of production for the farmers so he will be able to have a stable and a higher income during the process of production and next by providing the inputs to the farmers we can improve their productivity because we have a example such as the nutritional subsidy scheme but usually when input subsidies are given it is over utilized by the farmers that is what highlighted by the writer of this our editorial in the start for example when sub fertilizer subsidy was given it was over utilized by the people and the farmers so it led to the nutrition depletion and the degradation of soil quality that is why they introduced this nba scheme in the year 2010 by the ministry of chemicals and the fertilizer so here they wanted to promote the balanced usage of the fertilizer that's why they provided subsidies based on the nutrient quantity in the fertilizer by providing the agricultural subsidies they are also going to encourage the sustainable practices because we have one drop more crop a uh, system where they are encouraging the farmers to introduce uh, concepts like drip irrigation and sprinkler irrigation to reduce the usage of water during the irrigation process and another example we have is that pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana this scheme was launched in the year 2016 by the ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare where here they are going to provide the crop insurance for the crop failure because of the adverse conditions this is the aim of this scheme so thereby even though this agricultural subsidies are having many advantages it is also having disadvantages because it might be 
overused or be misused by the farmers. So, we have to regulate the schemes in order to deal with this disadvantages as well. So, talking about the food subsidies with, that we started in the first, it is focused on the consumers, they will ensure the affordable food access, it will be having an income transfer to the poor, it is nothing but as they can procure the food at the subsidized rate, they will have an excess income and this income can be used in the other essential services. It is also going to improve the health and nutrition control because they are met with the required caloric need for the day with the help of this uh, food grains which are provided by the government at the subsidized rate. So, it will improve the nutrition and the health of the people especially in the children and women. For example, we have a scheme called as the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana and this scheme was launched in the year 2020 that is during the COVID. So, here additional food grains were provided to the NFSA sub beneficiaries thereby it helped the people during the COVID conditions to meet the food requirements. And another scheme we have a scheme called as the Midday Meal Scheme, it is the famous scheme which was launched in the year 1995. So, under this scheme, free meals were given to the students of government as well as government aided schools. So, now we will discuss what are the impacts of this food subsidies. First is the poverty alleviation. It will enable the low income families to spend their excess savings on the other essential services. This we already discussed. It also helps us to reduce the hunger because with the help of the PDS and NFSA, we are going to have a steady food supply to the poor even in case of the economic fluctuations. This is what they are highlighting here because with the help of these schemes and act, there is a steady food supply even in the adverse conditions. So, by having a steady food supplies, they are able to meet the economic and next is the nutritional benefits with the help of PDS. The people will be ensured with the required caloric needs, but uh, the argument is that there is a requirement for the diversification of the products which are delivered in the PDS. Next important impact is the rural urban balance. So, this food subsidy is not only benefiting the consumers, it is also indirectly helpful for the producers because they have a guaranteed buyer for their products which will stabilize the income of the farmers by having a guaranteed buyer. And next is the COVID-19. As already said, we have a scheme called as the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana where there were additional free grains were given to the people during the pandemic. This was highly beneficial because many people who lost the job opportunity and the job during the COVID were highly dependent on the ration shops that were present throughout the countries. So, with this we will conclude the discussion on this editorial. We started with the food subsidies, we saw what are the types of food subsidies and then we saw what is agricultural subsidies, we saw what is the difference between both and lastly we ended what are the impacts of this food subsidy. With this, we will conclude the discussion on this article and now let us move on to the next one. Take a look at this editorial taken from the Hindu newspaper, move on the Madrasas, the alienation of Muslims. The context of this editorial is that the writer of this editorial is highlighting about the potential negative impacts because of the recommendation which was made by the National Commission for the Protection of Child Rights. So, what recommendation did they made? They said that they have to inspect the madrasas which are the Islamic educational institutions or working along the lines of the Right to Education Act. So, this is the article totally given here. What we have to concentrate is that what are the provisions of the Right to Education Act? What are the madrasas? Also, we have to learn about what are the constitutional provisions, what are the legal provisions to ensure the right to education in India. And added to that, we will also see some additional concept in relevance to this topic. These are the topics which are required based on these editorials for the mains perspective. And now let us start the discussion with the mains question first. Discuss the importance of ensuring a social justice in strengthening the India's integrity. Evaluate the initiatives taken so far. So, this is the question we are given with. Now, let us see the topics which we are going to discuss for this 
uh, editorial one by one. So, the Right to Education Act was enacted in the year 2009. So, we have an amendment called as the 86th Amendment of the 2002. So, this amendment introduced the Article 21A which says there is a free and compulsory education provided to the children who are belonging to the age group of 6 to 14. To implement this article, this act was enacted. This is the main aim of this act and it also says that the child, children and the students cannot be denied admission based on the prior grades and there is no availability of particular documents. So, this act's provision will be discussed one by one. So, another provision of this act is that there has to be a reservation in the private schools for about 25 percentage for the weaker section of the society uh, and they have to provide quality education standards such as they have to provide a better infrastructure along with the restrooms constructed within the uh, school. Also, there has to be proper teacher to student ratio along with updated teaching methods which has to be updated with the help of the teacher training programs. Another provision is that there is no detention policy that is the students cannot be held back up to the level of grade 8. This is the another important provision of this act. Also the punishment are prohibited under this act. So the punishment includes the corporal punishment which is the use of physical force to harm the children. Also it prohibits the mental harassment. This will ensure there is a safe learning environment for the children. Also, the school management cannot collect any illegal fees from the student and they cannot conduct any entrance test for particularly for the elementary admissions. There is also a requirement to the formation of the school management committee. This committee will have the members from the parents as well as local authority to ensure the governance in the school. Also to ensure the standard of teachers there, there has to be a particular eligibility for qualification for the appointment of teacher. There has to be regular conduct of trainings to improve their teaching methods. Also the teachers cannot conduct private tuitions on their own. These are the main provisions of this act. Now, there was a mention of madrasas in the article. Let us have a quick glimpse of it. So, madrasas are nothing but Islamic education institution where they mainly focus on the Quran, Hadith and Hik which is aiming to promote the Islamic culture and faith. They are provided with basic reading methods such as reading, writing. Also, they are also taught with the modern subjects such as maths and science. The main aim of this madrasa is to ensure and safeguard the culture and language of the Islams. Another good thing about this madrasa is that they provide the basic facilities such as the shelter, food and free education for the underprivileged section of the people. So, they will be having access to these features under the madrasas. The madrasas also focuses on the Islamic morals and the ethics such as the compassion, community responsibility and the honesty. So, these are the basic things you can know about the madrasas to have a understanding about what are madrasas. Now, we will see what are the mechanisms in India to ensure the protection of child rights. First, we will start with the constitutional provisions. As already said, we have article 21A which was introduced with the help of 86th amendment of 2002. This is the first article which ensures there is a free and compulsory education to the children. Similarly, we have another article in the DPSP which is the 51A clause K. So, this is also going to ensure the free and compulsory education to the children. And next we have the article 15 clause 3 which is providing the special provisions to the children and women. Actually article 15 deals with the prohibition of discrimination but this sub clause 3 is providing a positive discrimination to improve the vulnerable sections especially the children's. And we also have the DPSP article 39E and F. Article 39E deals with the protection of children from the subjected to unsuitable vacation and the hazardous condition. This is the aim of this article and in under article 
9 clause F, we have a aim to ensure a safe and healthy environment for the development of children. So, these are the constitutional provisions which are aiming to protect the rights of the children. Now, we will see what are the legal provisions available. First is the RTE Act which we discussed detailedly in the earlier slide. We also have the POCSO Act which is the protection of children against the Sexual Offences Act of 2012. So, this act aims to protect the children from the sexual abuse. We also have the Child Labour Act which was recently amended in the year 2016. It prohibits the employment of children who are under the age of 14. We also have a Juvenile Justice Act. The main focus of this act is to provide the care and rehabilitation services for the children who are in the conflict with the law. So, these are some legal frameworks which are designed by the government of India to ensure the child rights. So, now we will see some national institution which are aiming to protect the child rights. First is the National Commission for the Protection of Child Rights and the State Commission for the Protection of Child Rights. So, they wanted to enforce the child rights in India. And then we have the Children Working Committee. They wanted to help in the vulnerable children and protect the rights of the children. For example, they mainly focus on the children who are in the streets and who are subjected to abuse in the life. And next we have the, the integrated child protection scheme. So, the main aim of this scheme is to protect the children who are in the challenging situations such that we mentioned before that is having staying in the streets or in, they are subjected to abuse in the home as well as in the other public spaces. So, now we will see what are the mechanism to ensure the social justice in India. These are the constitutional provisions article 14 which ensures the equality before law and the equal protection of law. Under this article every individual and citizen in the country is ensured with the equality in the life. And under Article 15, it prohibits the discrimination on the basis of race, religion, caste, sex and the birth. And Article 16 provides for the equality of opportunity in case of the public employment. But certain positive discrimination is provided that is we are providing reservation for the weaker sections especially the SC, ST and the OBC that is we have a Mandal Commission report based on which 27 percentage reservation is given to the OBC in the public employment and for ST we have the 15 percentage and the ST we have 7.5 percentage reservation. And article 17 allows for the abolition of untouchability in any form. If an individual is subjected to untouchability in any public spheres, they can go directly to the courts to fight against the untouchability and article 46 it promotes the educational and economic welfare of the society this is a dpsp which is the aim of the government now we will see what are the legislative framework which are designed to ensure the social justice first we have the scnst prevention of atrocities act which was enacted in the year 1989 it prevents the people from any kind of discrimination. And second, we have the Protection of Civil Rights Act. So, this is called also called as the Prohibition of Untouchability Act. The main aim of this act is to abolish the untouchability in any form. If any individual is declined access to any public spaces, they are entitled to fight for their right under this act. Even though discrimination is in any form is prohibited in India, it allows for the positive discrimination as well. One such example is the reservation, where reservation is given in the educational institution and in jobs in the legislature. And lastly, we have the Right to Information Act, which will enhance the transparency among the government and will enforce the accountability to the people. Now, we will see what is the legal aid and judicial mechanism to ensure the social justice in India. One such example is the public interest litigation. So, this is a public interest case which can be filed by any individual to promote the public interest. It can be filed by the person who is affected. It can also be 
filed by the person who is not affected but is aiming to ensure the social justice for the group of people who are vulnerable. So, many PIL are filed by the social activists to ensure the human rights of the people. And we also have a free legal aid condition under the Article 39A where the poor people who do not have access to the costly justice, costly legal services can use this provision to gain access to the justice. So, with this we will conclude the discussion on this editorial. In this editorial, we saw what is RTE Act. We also saw what is Madrasas. We had a short glimpse of it. And later, we saw what are the provisions to ensure the child rights to India. What are the provisions that are there to ensure the child rights? We saw what are the constitutional provisions, what are the legal provisions. We saw what are the national institutions there. And lastly, we saw what are the provisions which are there similarly to ensure the social justice in India. With this, we will conclude the discussion on this article and now let us move on to the next one. Take a look at this editorial, Lifting Spirits. So, this editorial is mainly discussing about the recent Supreme Court ruling which is actually favoring the states because it is allowing them to tax the industrial alcohol. So, this industrial alcohol is a key revenue force for the revenue source for the many states. So, this decision has overturned the previous ruling on the 1990 because that ruling banned the state to tax the industrial alcohol because they said that it is limiting the intoxicating liquor because these are items which are meant for the human consumption. And our Chief Justice of India, D.Y. Chandra Chud, has argued that the broader interpretation of the constitutional terms saying that the intoxicating liquor could include the industrial alcohol. This ruling, the current ruling is actually aligning with the court's recent decision which is allowing the states to collect the royalties from the mining leases, to shift from the current situation and empower the state governments to generate a greater revenue independently. Because the GST introduction has reduced their revenue collection. So, this ruling has generated a method or a way to increase their income independently. Now, we will see what is this from the mains perspective detaily. Let us start with the mains question. The mains question is discuss how the quasi federal structure of India is impacting the distribution of powers between the center and the state government. We have to cite examples from the recent judicial rulings. This is the question we are given with. Now, let us see the content one by one. As we all know, federalism is the cornerstone of the Indian constitution because there is a need for the balance of power between the central government and the state government. But we have to understand that we are going to have, we are having a federalism with a stronger central tendency. So, we have to understand the constitutional basis for the separation of power between the center and state. Actually, the constitutional basis is actually given in the seventh schedules among the 12 schedules, which consist of almost three lists, the union list, the state list and the concurrent list. And many important matters such as the defense, foreign affairs, which require national security concerns are legislated by the central government because it is a more representative body than comparing to the specific state government. We also have areas such as the police, health and intoxicating drugs under the state lists and the states are going to legislate on these areas. And Later, we have the third list which is the concurrent list where the powers are shared between the central government and the state government. But you have to understand that the state government will have less power and the central government will have more power with respect to if there are any conflicts on the case of legislating the act. The subjects which are included in this concurrent list is uh, such as the education, labor, welfare, etc., the forest, education. Actually, it is given in the article 246, which are 
stated with the union list, state list and the concurrent list. Now we will see what are the powers of the state governments with respect to the special powers. In certain matters only the state government will have some extra powers. Let us see one by one. First is the police and the public orders which are given in the entry 1. Here the state government is given with exclusive power. This will enable them to address the local crimes as well as to ensure the laws and the public safety. And with respect to the manufacturing, sale and the consumption of intoxicating liquors, the states can legislate the law within their jurisdiction. This will allow the states to generate the revenue by taxation on the liquor. This will also help them to address the public health issues and the social issues arising out of it. And third, we have the betting and the gambling under the entry 9. The states will have the authority to regulate as well as prohibit the betting and the gambling services. And this will enable them to control the legality as well as operation of any gambling establishment. This will also help them to impact the local economy. Also, under the entry 27, we have the power of trade and commerce within the state. So, in under this entry, the state has the power to legislate on the trade, commerce as well as business activity which are conducted within the boundaries. And this power is enabling them to regulate the local markets as well as to support the local businesses which will improve the economic growth of that particular state. So, now we will talk about how to balance the federalism in India. As already said, we have a quasi-federal structure. Even though we are having a clear division of power based on the 7th schedule, even then the central government has more authority, especially during the period of the emergency. Talking about the intergovernmental relations, the institutions such as the Interstate Council, are having a say to facilitate the discussion especially on the cooperative federalism. You also have to understand that the Supreme Court rulings have sometimes reinforced the powers of the state. For example, the taxation rights. So, this will contribute to a balance between the center and the state. So, now we will discuss about what are the methods to improve the revenue generation by the state autonomically. What are the methods that can be used by the states to improve the revenue generation independently? Let us see one by one. First is with respect to the taxation powers. The states can impose tax on the items which are enlisted in the state list. For example, the property tax, the VAT tax, the sales tax on the excise duty with respect to the alcohol. And they can they also have the power to tax the industrial alcohol based on the current ruling which will also improve their revenue generation options. And thirdly, they can focus more on the self-generated revenues rather than focusing on the central transfers. This will help them to maintain a physical health even though there is a poor revenue generation. They can also enhance the revenue independence by supporting the local development projects and the welfare programs which are specifically designed to meet the needs of the states. While discussing the context of the article, we saw the GST has heavily impacted few states of the India. Now, we will see what are the impacts of GST on the revenue generation by the states. First is the loss of revenue autonomy. Many states have limited powers with respect to the taxation of the goods and services because most of the revenue that are generated through the taxation is falling under the GST framework right now. Also, there is a high dependence on the central compensation. Many states are dependent upon the compensation which are provided by the state from the central governments which are contributing to the short incomes in the revenue. This is further creating a dependency cycle upon the central government by the state government. Another major issue with respect to the GST is the delayed compensation issues. Few states are facing challenges in receiving the timely compensation from the central government. This is also further impacting the planning of the budget as well as the fiscal stability of that state. 
talking about the opportunities for the non gst revenue we can increase the focus on the alternate revenue resources such as the taxing on the alcohol which is mentioned in this editorial to reduce the impact of the gst related losses having discussed all the issues now we will see what is the solution for all these problems first is to enhance the revenue autonomy we saw many strategies to deal with this now the states can explore many new taxation avenues such as the industrial alcohol which is mentioned in this editorial to improve their independence in the revenue generation and next we have the strategy that is to diversify the revenue resources we can encourage the states to diversify their revenue bases by this can be done by uh, developing the local industries by developing the local tourism and other sectors this will eventually reduce the dependence on the central government we can also develop the capacity building this can be this can be done by investing in the state capacity which will help them to manage the finances much better and will improve the collection of revenues which will further improve the delivery of the public services to the people another important thing is that we can also strengthen the intergovernmental cooperation through conduction of regular dialogues and the financial agreements this will help us to address the revenue sharing issues and promote the cooperative federalism among the central and the state and the last and final solution to deal with this problem is to review the gst compensation mechanism because by improving the framework we can enhance the timely transfer of the compensation which will address the issue much efficiently so in this editorial we saw what is the cooperative federalism what is federalism what are the impact because of the gst introduction and what are the methods which can be followed by the states to improve their revenue generation and we concluded with the way forward to all the problems which which we enlisted in the earlier Uh, discussion with this we will conclude the discussion on this article we have come to end of today's video if you found the video informative do hit like give your feedbacks as comment and don't forget to subscribe thank you have a nice day